Hi, my name is Jim Bruton. I live in Connecticut and Other Side Media asked me to join you today to share my near-death experience. You know, it can be kind of a, a wide subject to just jump in and talk about. So I've narrowed it down to saying, you know, here are the five truths from my experience that have impacted my life. I'll talk about my background, the near-death experience itself, and then basically the five truths that I would say could be best distilled from the experiences. You know, so when I was a boy growing up in the 1960s, I loved watching black and white television shows about animals and the conservation efforts that helped them. You know, as a little boy growing up in the 1960s, when we were in this big race against the Russians to get to the moon, there were a lot of utopian visions of the future. Moon tourism in the year 2000, you know, just basically you have flying saucers in every garage and things like that. And I just knew, you know, with my imagination, I wanted to be part of it. And I wanted to be part of it right now. I didn't want to wait, you know, 30 or 40 years. So, you know, I would start drawing what I call inventions. They definitely look like something a fourth grader would draw, but it really got my mind churning in ways to think outside the box. And since then, I redesigned the way video and data can be transmitted by using small satellite antennas, basically shrinking a satellite TV truck into a backpack. And I was the first person in the world to do it. And uh, I had tested it with Bell Laboratories, the people who invented the dial tone. And they first said, oh, it won't work. And I said, well, I've got a prototype in the car. And it worked. So that was kind of fun. Later, I integrated my system with these biometrics that were destined for the International Space Station. Uh, you could wear them or even swallow them. And we've tested them twice up at Mount Everest. Later in high school, I built my own hang glider out of bamboo. And then later, I built and flew a World War I reproduction aircraft, uh, as I loved that age of discovery and flight, when things were new, when you would you know, land and take it back into the barn or hangar and tweak something and just you know, keep changing the model in order to improve the experience of flying. So as I mentioned, I love building these old airplanes, these historical reproductions. My second aircraft which almost looked like something out of a Disney cartoon. It was called a Flying Flea. It was from 1933 in France and basically looked like a soapbox derby car uh, with two big wings and a big motorcycle engine right in front of my face spinning a huge propeller. It was really cute. And I think that was one of the things I loved. I built my World War I fighter. So having done my macho thing, I can now build something that looked more whimsical. Well, on its second test flight, which was on October 6th, 2016, I did a round across the airfield. And then on my second trip, I lost my engine. And there wasn't a lot of time to react to that because being a vintage aircraft didn't glide as well as the modern aircraft. So when you cut power, it came down quickly. I couldn't make it back to my airfield. I was in a very forested, hilly and rocky area. So the only place I could hope to get to was a small lake in a nearby Boy Scout camp. So I aimed for that, over, <laughs> overshot the bank, crashed into all the tree trunks, again, in the equivalent of a soapbox derby car at around 70 miles an hour. I can still find where I crashed because of all the scratch marks on the tree trunks from my wings breaking off. Because it was an all-wood aircraft, when I stopped crashing, it was pretty much just all matchsticks around me. The only part of the airplane that was still intact was what was behind me that I was still seat belted to. Luckily, there was a, a retired police officer fishing in this Boy Scout camp. Luckily, was the kind of guy who wouldn't freak out, you know, at seeing all this and seeing me in the crash. So he called 911, kept me propped up for this reason. I broke all my ribs. I ruptured both lungs. My right leg had multiple fractures. I had a hole in my lower back from the engine battery breaking loose and hitting me again at probably 70 miles an hour. And I was just, you know, really beat up. And I couldn't breathe because I really didn't have functioning lungs. I was more gasping for air. But he called 911. They sent out a helicopter that came maybe, I don't know, 30 or 45 minutes later. They pulled me out of what was left of the aircraft and flew me up to Hartford, Connecticut's trauma center. So a few hours later, my family arrived at the hospital and found me in a breathing machine as my lungs didn't work. And I was intubated with other tubes coming in and going out of my body. All these were keeping me alive. I'd already escaped the restraints that my, you know, limited my efforts to remove the tubing. Uh, and the medical team advised my family that with a week's worth of day-long operations scheduled, some with only a 2% chance of success, that the best course of action would be to place me into a medically induced coma. They readily agreed, and so that's what the doctors did. As best as logic can serve, 
I think that's when my near-death experience began. As far as how long it lasted, I can't say, but I can say I was in the coma for a week. And I can say that while I was on the other side, I was very, very busy. This isn't your usual near-death experience where people may see themselves like on an operating table and then they go through a tunnel of light, they see dead loved ones, they go to a beautiful landscape, maybe have a life review. Mine was quite different. So for me, it was more like I teleported up onto the terrace of a tall building. It was very open and everything was gray as if made out of concrete and in ruins. A building stretched out into the distance, each partially destroyed, but weaving together to create a post-apocalyptic skyline. Imagine New York or LA a thousand years after a meteor strike or an asteroid or something blew it up. And there was no sound of any sort. It was just that quiet. As I looked up in the sky, I could see these clouds really dark and heavy with the mother of all storms ready to unload everything they had. Suddenly a wave of nausea ran through my stomach and I doubled over in pain and grabbed my gut. And I remember whispering aloud, I don't think I can stand this. And with those words, I sent something to my left. And what I saw was one of the strangest sculptures I've ever seen. Standing out against the darkest parts of the brooding sky was a large egg-shaped sculpture made out of like lattice work of metal. And I could see within it these small whirling patterns and I could hear their whispering movements uh, slow down within. And this interruption of the place's absolute stillness I knew was due to my spoken words and somehow I knew this thing and I were connected. Still feeling my stomach gripped in pain, I, I rose to my feet and did my best to walk over to this monolith. As I looked through that open latticework, I could see gears inside. They were suspended freely in space, but they were anchored and pivoting around an invisible, unique pivot point that defined their sweeping arcs of movement. I noticed that these were what they call sector gears, the kind you see in clock-like mechanisms. When you think of a gear normally, it's a, a wheel with little teeth all the way around it. A sector gear is a part of that gear, and it's usually meant to just move back and forth. So it has a beginning, a middle, and an end to its movement. And that's significant in the story. As I watched the gears just sort of idly moving for a moment, I could see that some were very real and definite, and others were more ghost-like, and they would pass through each other, you know, in a physically impossible manner. And I remember saying, what is this thing? I said that out loud. And a disembodied voice responded within my consciousness, and it stayed with me throughout the entire experience. And it said, this is the future birthing into the now. And that otherworldly dance of the gears were very complex, like a multidimensional model of time. And they came to rest, and I reached through a gap in the side of the egg. And as I did so, it said, this is the process of becoming. And as I looked at the gears within my mind, I could see something like a video feed of what were future events. You know, I might see myself as older. I might see my kids with their children, things like this that hadn't happened yet. And as I you know, reached my hand through to see if I could touch them, because like I said, some were very definite and some were very ghost-like. I just want to say, gosh, can I feel them? One brushed by my hand and instantly I doubled over in pain again, that nausea in my stomach. With a reflex, I ripped it out, you know, pulling it through the lattice work and I threw it away. And as it did that, all the gears went crazy, spinning around, spinning around. Basically, they were recalibrating for the loss of one. And I said, what's happening now? And the voice said, each gear is the probability of a thought, word, or action in your future. Your destiny is resetting itself around what you have removed. I said, how did I know I could do that? Pull that gear out, removing that future moment. And the voice said, why else are you here? And I said, I have no idea. I don't even know what this place is. They said, you're in the in-between. I said, in between what? I said, everything. The impossible now between the past and the future. And I said something like, that makes no sense whatsoever. And it said, it's impossible in its short duration. Yet here you are standing inside the eternity of a single moment. Do you remember who you are in the world to which you belong? And I promise you, if somebody had come up to me at that moment and said, do you remember the world to which your body belongs? If you stay any longer, you can't go back. I'd say, go back where? To your family. What family? I really had no idea. I was so present and actually so depersonalized. Everything was stripped away of who I thought I was. And I said, I have no idea. And then the voice said, you see now the truth 
in how the past is dust. I said, okay, why do some of these gears, these futures that I touch make me sick and not others? And it said, all choices have unintended consequences, some unfortunate and some not. The pain each brings is your guide. I said, where are the fe- gears that feel good? And it said, you're not here to feel good. And I, a new gear then swung into view. And on this one, I saw a Ferris wheel with happy grandchildren who aren't born yet whizzing by. Their fingers holding onto the car and they smiled at me or through me, you know, looking off into their own world. Obviously, I let that gear pass by and I didn't remove it. More gears then emerged within view, some passing through others, several, again, clear and definite, many less so and hard to focus on. But each one that I looked at had their clear images, that video feed of their meaning. And each time they came to rest, I would reach around and pull out a gear that I could feel by my pain to be to my future detriment. It's like these unintended consequences, the pain of bad, not wrong, because you can make a mistake and it's not a sin, but these wrong decisions were what were causing the pain. And at one point I looked at the growing pile of gears behind me and I asked, it's starting to look like if I don't have a bad future, I have no future at all. I said, even though I now feel less pain because I'm cleaning up my future, stacking the deck, if you will, I said, am I going to die sooner from doing all this? And it said, your destiny has to fit itself around futures that aren't meant to be. Your number of breaths are already counted. I will worry about your last one. I said, I don't know how comforting that is. And it said, eliminating bad choices doesn't mean you won't make wrong ones. You won't know they are wrong until after they pass. Since right and wrong are variable over which you have no control, the answers to what come tomorrow are a waste. Better is understanding the beauty of how everything fits and refits together. It's basically telling me, have faith in the grand design. And I said, what am I missing here in my lack of understanding? It was quite obvious that I was was only perceiving or understanding a tenth, if that, of what was there. It said, what is clearly before you? Grace. No one deserves salvation. It can only be given by grace. It is your birthright, but it must be chosen at the expense of the world that separates us. I said, well, this fixing my future is painful and I feel ashamed I'm not doing it with some moral compass. I'm only guided by pain. I don't even know where or when these futures happen. I said, where or when are not important. Removing your enthusiasm to further chain yourself to the world isn't as painful as carrying the crushing weight of those chains once forged around you. He said, it's as if this place were made so I can do one thing and one thing only with no chance to screw it up. And the voice then said, if those with choices make poor use of them, then offering fewer possibilities could be called mercy. You can't change the past, but you can make better choices in the future. Everything is interconnected and pay more attention to your relationships. Be gentle with everyone as I am gentle with you. And I thought about my pain and I said, gentle, what's gentle about all this? They said, you prayed for something for which being here is the answer. And now the man who fell from the sky is not the same who flew into it. With that, I looked up at the stone gray sky and then out across the seemingly dead and abandoned city. I looked back to the egg and reaching out, placed my hand on it. And I said, I think I can live with this now. And with that, it pretty much booted me out. I woke up in a hospital and I was told by the doctors I was in a plane crash and they ran down the list of all my injuries. I discovered I was put into a coma on my arrival and that was for one week. And for that entire time, I believe I was in the in-between and didn't stop yanking out gears until I left. One thing that's interesting is, as I lay there with this just going over and over my head, remember, I just came out of the coma and I've just come out of this experience. So I was laying there and it was as if the memory of what I've just shared with you was cycling through my mind. I'm like, what is this? I, I figured, okay, I've had an out of body experience being somewhat conversant with, you know, Eastern ways, but I still really didn't have a name for it. I, I don't think I knew that this was what a near death experience was. So it just went over and over in my head. And I would say at this point, what does this mean for me? What does this mean for everything? And so the best thing I could do was just sort of say this distilled down into five of the most fundamental truths. So starting with the first one, you know, it's like return. What is the best version of myself? And this is a question I'm sure we could ask ourselves any day of the year. I remember as I woke up, 
I saw this photo of me taped to the wall. It was obviously put there by someone who wanted me to remember who I was in an effort of encouragement and healing. And this photo was kind of like a, a Match.com photo, if you will. It was me in northern Afghanistan smoking cigars with uh, the tribesmen. And, you know, for a lot of people, I say, yeah, that's Jim the Badass. You know, that's the best version of Jim. And I was like, who's that? You know, I looked at the photo and thought about how many lifetimes ago that already was. And again, to those who knew me, yeah, that would be the best version of myself because that's how the world would measure it. But over the next few days, it began to feel differently about that man in the picture. And instinctively, I was coming to see that my best version was not that, but was the depersonalized conscious being in the in-between stripped of everything, knowing neither joy nor sorrow, but flowing in the now that impossible now beyond time in that state of letting go. You know, laying there in the hospital, coming to grips with my NDE, uh, my mind suddenly began conversing with the in-between. The representation of alcohol was removed from me and held up for consideration. And uh, the in-between literally asked me if I wanted to take it with me into my future or leave it behind. It said, if I wanted to keep it as part of my life, then it, the in-between, would carry it for me. If I wanted to leave it in my past, then it would remove all attachment and it would have no pull on me. I immediately said without hesitation, I'd leave it behind. And the voice then said, all right. And the representation simply evaporated from sight. And I've not had a drink since, nor am I inclined to. I can sit in a bar with people drinking. I can go to a wine store on the way to someone's house to, you know, take something. But it never occurs to me to do it. And so I would say that was my first real taste in the power of letting go, which brings us to truth number two. What is the art of letting go? Well, whatever answer I could give, putting it in context, I'd say while the world chases the next big thing, you know, what if we tried a different approach? If we don't like it, we can always ditch it and go back to scratching the dirt like everyone else, swapping stories of how we know someone who knows someone who heard of someone else who made it. And to me, life isn't about chasing the next big thing. It's about letting go. It's totally the opposite. It's about detachment of owning your power to make good choices moment by moment that reduce the number of bad potential choices and their outcomes. It's an understanding that has no context. It's simply a state of knowing that gives rise to meaning and meaning backs into our individual lives to give us some sense of our unique purpose. You're not the center of any particular universe. And once you understand this, you see that little of what anyone is doing has much to do with you personally. Well, a dual mind is where something is simplistically only this or that. You know, these binary polarities of it's us or them, it's good or bad, you're vaccinated or unvaccinated, you know, whatever. So we argue and struggle to reconcile those polarities. Meditation and open-mindedness need lead to a non-dual state of mind, where we think in terms of and instead of or that simple change of perspective changes the world, us and them, not us or them. To let go, start by allowing choices to unfold naturally. Wait as long as you can before choosing to allow other possibilities to fully mature. Truth number three, I mentioned a little while ago about dual and non-dual thinking. Another way is also calling it linear and non-linear thinking. Linear being, you know, we step in, we think in steps and non-linear means we think more broadly. For example, the usual question would be who robbed the bank? Linear thinking would pursue answers through a step-by-step -step process that have go-no-go -no -go gates, if you will, at each conclusion of a step deciding whether to move on or go around again. And thinking this way is pretty much about the black and white of things. So what happens to your problem solving journey if your primary assumptions or procedures break down? And yet, this is how most of the world thinks. The better question would be, why do people rob banks? Nonlinear thinking brings understanding by promoting thinking and problem solving that extends in an outward expansion spiral versus that linear approach. It provides multiple starting points from which you can study or enter a problem. And you start to see different ways through it. Rather than trying to solve that surface symptom, you start looking at causes. It's also a more evolved way of thinking. It's natural to think this way when being present. Instead of following the breadcrumbs, you can see the loaf. Your awareness of this emerges when you realize you aren't using your memory to understand things. You don't need memory to perceive a complex and dynamic pattern moving in front of you. When you're really present, it's with no memory of the past or anticipation of the future. It's with your intuition. 
It's like flying without a net. Truth number four, being authentic and how even atheists can be spiritual. Extending this thought, I've come to believe that even if you're an atheist, but you live your life authentically, then you can be living it spiritually, or at least laying the foundation to do so. There are many people who say they believe in God, but they don't live a life that demonstrates the choices or sacrifices you would expect if you were making the same declarations. And you don't have to look far to find examples. But what about the people who do own their shortcomings, who don't justify them or dismiss their bad choices offhandedly, but totally own who they are, warts and all? Isn't there a humility there that makes such a person worth learning from? Let me clarify, I'm thinking generally about people who may be different or even quirky, but aren't dangerous to our physical safety or mental health. How unusual is it for us to challenge them about something in their behavior? And with a disarming authenticity, they acknowledge it, confirming it needs further work. For me, I'd rather know where you stand and hear you own your own faults than hide the issues behind our love for a shared goal or dislike of a common enemy. At least then, like I said, I know where you stand. Think about this. If you're setting an example for countless people who have the courage to address their own shortcomings and get to work on their growth, that there are people watching you more than you know. And so you're actually helping more than you can imagine. Living authentically goes back to Socrates, man, know thyself. This is why I've told my kids not to ask, where is my perfect girlfriend or my perfect boyfriend? But they should ask themselves, how do I need to be loved? Don't ask what you should do for a living, but ask what makes me happy and feel engaged. Don't ask, what is my purpose in life? Ask what the meaning of life is as you see it. And then back that into the question of what your unique purpose is, given your unique interests and abilities. What resonates with you? Are there consistent patterns of self-sabotage you engage in? What brings out the best or worst in you? Honest self-reflection reveals ways in which we can do better. And that is thinking authentically. Note that you know, a good test of authenticity is when people talk about saving the world. Some say peace, some say war, some say you know, force compliance, and a few say communicate. But saving the world starts at home, at the kitchen table, on the knee of a parent, or at the feet of a grandparent. Then it grows into living a life in the spirit of service to others, no matter your job or career. It's the spirit that counts. Doing the things that make you feel connected to other people, perhaps helping those less fortunate. Sometimes leading from behind, allowing others to think it was their idea. Sharing the spotlight whenever possible, for no one arrived where they are alone. I'm not saying to become passive and let people walk all over you. Some fights are worth fighting, if not for yourself, then for others. But see the world for what it is. See relationships for the temporary comforts of distraction or distractions they are. And remember that all of us are just passing through. And that brings us to the last truth, number five, letting go. One of the things I, I discovered in going to my first near-death experience conference in 2019 was that when two in the ears meet, they don't usually need an introduction. It's like we recognize something within us immediately. In a moment, we're in deep and personal conversation, comparing notes of our lives here on Earth. If we don't see each other for a long time, we still have a sense of connection that connects us. And sometimes we feel the emotional state of each other from very far away. No effort is needed to establish that connection or to maintain it. Like I said, the two vibrating tuning forks, our mutually resonating tuning forks keep each other going no matter where we are. If you ask me, what is the meaning of life? I have no answer because you are life. What else can I add? Just walk it, discover it, and realize that you are nothing you were told you are. And when you die, Everything you think you are is left at the door. You are more. You are everything. And when you've asked all your questions, and when there's nothing left to be gained, where all roads end, there God begins. Thank you.